Welcome to PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. It's greatly appreciated. In this video, we're going to discuss methicoline challenge testing. The European Respiratory Society published technical standards on methicoline challenge testing in 2017. However, a lot of confusion persists about how these tests should be administered, and there's still a lot of variation in practice between laboratories. In this video, I will show you how to administer methicoline challenge test based on the ERS technical standards. First, let's talk about what the results of a methicoline challenge really mean. Here are three commonly held beliefs about how a methicoline challenge test should be interpreted. A methicoline challenge will determine whether or not you have asthma. If the methicoline challenge is positive, you have asthma. If the methicoline challenge is negative, you don't have asthma. No, it's not that simple. Uh, a methicoline challenge test determines the presence of airway hyperresponsiveness. Nearly everyone will develop bronchoconstriction from inhaling methicoline if given large enough doses. However, the airways of patients with asthma constrict too much and they constrict too easily. So it only takes small doses of methicoline to produce bronchospasm in most asthmatics. So a methicoline challenge seeks to determine if the patient develops bronchoconstriction from small doses of methicoline. If they do, airway hyperresponsiveness is present. Airway hyperresponsiveness is a feature of asthma, but it is not exclusive to asthma. Who else may respond to methicoline? Patients with COPD, cystic fibrosis, bronchitis, sarcoidosis, allergic rhinitis, and there's even some individuals with asymptomatic airway hyperresponsiveness, and I'm going to show you an example of that next. This is the case report that I had published in Respiratory Care back in 2007. This is a 20-year-old collegiate athlete, a soccer player. She had allergic rhinitis, and remember from the previous slide, that can be uh, a group of patients that can respond to methicoline even if they don't have asthma. She had absolutely no asthma symptoms at all. She was one of the best players on her team, but her primary care provider referred her for a methicoline challenge test to screen her for asthma because her father was asthmatic. Here are the results of her baseline spirometry test. As you can see, everything is really normal, and there's certainly no sign of airflow obstruction. The methicoline challenge test showed significant airway hyperresponsiveness with a PC20, the provocative concentration of methicoline resulting in a 20% decline in FEV1, a little less than 4 milligrams per ml. So the question is, now what do you do? You have a collegiate athlete with normal spirometry and no symptoms, but a positive methicoline challenge. Are you going to start treating her for asthma based on this single test? Keeping in mind that it's been reported that upwards of 30% of patients with allergic rhinitis may have a positive methicoline challenge test with no signs or symptoms of asthma. So let's apply Bayes' theorem to this case. Bayes' theorem says that the pretest probability of a problem, in this case asthma, impacts the post-test probability of the problem. In other words, you may interpret the same test result a little differently if the probability of the problem is higher or lower in different patients. For example, you may interpret a small EKG change a little differently in a fit asymptomatic 28-year-old than you would in a 65-year-old smoker who has uh, chest pain, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. In this image, you can see that the pretest probability of asthma is plotted against the post-test probability of asthma in different lines of different uh, PC20s. So if you had two patients, both who had a PC20 of 4, but had different pretest probabilities of asthma, you would interpret these tests differently. So for example, as depicted in the blue line, if this particular patient had a 50-50 pretest probability of asthma, you really weren't sure either way, and you extend this line up to the 4 milligram per ml uh, line, and then come across to the post-test probability, you can see that the post-test probability is a little over 80%. So that would be a pretty helpful test. However, in our patient, the collegiate soccer player, I would say that the pretest probability is very low, less than 10%. So if we just say 5% and we go up with the red line here up to the 4 milligram per ml PC20 line and go across to the post-test probability, you can still see that it's less than 20%. So it's not a very helpful test despite the response to methicoline. I'm not a physician, but if I were, I would diagnose this patient with asymptomatic airway hyperresponsiveness, and my treatment plan would be don't inhale methicoline. A lot of people like to live in the dichotomous world of always or never, positive or negative, like a pregnancy test. 
but most things don't work like that and certainly a methacholine challenge test is not a pregnancy test for asthma. So if a patient demonstrates airway hyperresponsiveness from small doses of methacholine, there is a higher probability of asthma. If the patient does not show airway hyperresponsiveness to small doses of methacholine, the probability of asthma is unlikely. But we need to use Bayesian thinking and consider the pretest probability of asthma when trying to draw conclusions from the test result. So who should undergo methacholine challenge testing? This should be considered very carefully. Ideally subjects with an intermediate probability of asthma, 30 to 70 percent. Asthma-like symptoms, there's risk factors like a lot of allergies, cat allergy, family history. There may be an unclear response to therapy, but their there clinical doubt exists on whether or not they have asthma. Patients with, who are low probability generally should not be tested uh, as you saw on the previous slide, you may get a false positive and then you have to figure that out. Uh, the, the one exception here would be if asthma needs to be ruled out for whatever reason, then it would be appropriate to, to use this tool. Uh, also, people who are high probability, patients who have a standing diagnosis of asthma, symptoms requiring multiple medications, a positive response to therapy, multiple risk factors, previously hospitalized, ER visits, uh, if you know that they have asthma, there's no reason to confirm it with a methacholine challenge test. Whenever I do any teaching about methacholine challenge testing, I always like to include that as my starting point. That what is a methacholine really telling you? And I think a lot of people do treat it like a pregnancy test. And as I've shown you, that can be a big mistake. But let's shift gears now and discuss how to perform a methacholine challenge test based largely on the 2017 ERS technical standards. I don't follow all of the ERS recommendations, but I'll explain why. Um, but even when technical standards are used as a reference, there are some variability on how methacholine challenge tests are performed. So I'm gonna share with you how I do it. One of the more significant changes in the 2017 ERS technical standards is a recommendation that methacholine response be judged by the provocative dose that results in a 20% fall in FEV1 and not the concentration. So earlier I talked about the PC20, the provocative concentration of methacholine causing a 20% decline in FEV1, but now the recommendation is to use the PD20, the provocative dose of methacholine causing a 20% reduction in FEV1. So what is meant by the methacholine dose? Well the methacholine dose is the product of methacholine deposition in the airway times the breathing time or the breath count. Nebulizer performance for methacholine challenge testing is described in this paper that we had published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine a few years ago. Basically the inhaled mass of methacholine is the product of the drug concentration, nebulizer output, and inspiratory time. And this is multiplied by the respirable fraction, which is the percent of aerosol particles that are the right size to deposit in the respiratory tract. So let's review an example of how focusing on dose rather than concentration may be important. In this scenario, we're going to use standard concentrations of methacholine as shown on the right side of the screen. Patient A had the methacholine challenge test performed using a low output nebulizer and had a 20% decline in FEV1 at the 16 mg per ml concentration. Patient B also had a 20% decline in FEV1 at the 16 mg per ml concentration but for patient B, a high output nebulizer was used. These patients have the same PC20 of 16 milligrams per ml, but is it really the same response? The answer is no. Despite the same PC20, patient A had a more significant response to methacholine because a low output nebulizer was used. In other words, they had the same FEV1 response after being delivered less methacholine than patient B. For patient A with a low output nebulizer, a 20% decline in FEV1 at the 16 mg per ml step may translate into a PD20 of 380 micrograms, which would be considered abnormal. A PD20 greater than 400 is considered normal. However, for patient B with the high output nebulizer, a 20% decline in FEV1 at the 16 mg per ml step may translate into a PD20 of 680 micrograms, which is categorized as a normal response. Now, if patient A with the low output nebulizer had a 20% decline in FEV1 at the 16 mg per ml step, resulting in a PD20 of 300 micrograms, and patient B with the high output nebulizer 
had a 20% decline in FEV1 at the 4 milligram per ml step, also re resulting in a PD20 of 300 micrograms. This would be considered the same response, even though patient A has a PC20 of 16 milligrams per ml, and patient B has a PC20 of 4 milligrams per ml. Just a word about the methacholine itself. Uh, there are a couple of ways that you can uh, obtain methacholine. We use the pre-made kits as shown here. They cost a little more, but they save a lot of time. Uh, they remove the element of human error, and they have a shelf life of six months, and you don't need to refrigerate them. Uh, you can also buy the dry methacholine uh, that comes in that brown light-protected bottle. It's not hard to reconstitute them, but it does take about 10 to 15 minutes, and it does introduce the possibility of human error. If you choose to reconstitute the dry methacholine powder, you can go to methapharmrespiratory.com and on their site they have directions on how to reconstitute the methacholine. It's very simple to do. You can choose either the ATS short or quadrupling doses or you can use the so-called long doses that are doubling. In my opinion, using the short quadrupling doses is more helpful in clinical practice. It certainly takes a little less time to do the test. Let's talk about the question about whether you should use a saline diluent step prior to delivering methacholine. Remember that when a diluent dose is used, the change in FEV1 is based on the post-diluent FEV1, not the baseline pre-dilutant FEV1. The ERS states that most current protocols start with a diluent step and we support its use. Some of the benefits of using a diluent step is that it gives the opportunity for the patient to practice using the nebulizer and perform spirometry. And most reference data used for interpretation use the diluent step. However, they also go on to say that only the most hyper-responsive patients will respond to a diluent, about 1%. A diluent step doesn't improve the safety of the test. The endpoint is not affected by a diluent step. The diluent adds time to each test and spirometry variability related to the diluent step may decrease the accuracy of the measurement of airway hyperresponsiveness. For all of those reasons, I do not use a diluent step. I think it is a waste of time, and I prefer the FEV1 changes to be based on the baseline FEV1, not the post-diluent FEV1. The ERS technical standards state that any nebulizer is suitable for methacholine challenge testing so long as you know the nebulizer output and you construct a protocol to administer an appropriate amount of methacholine. The ERS standards recommend a protocol with tidal breathing of methacholine for one minute or more when using a breath actuated or continuous nebulizer. We use the Aero Eclipse breath actuated nebulizer. Uh, the methacholine output of the nebulizer is known, and in my experience this is a good product. As I said, you can use whatever nebulizer you like, but you have to know the output of the nebulizer. So let's test this recommendation with the calculations listed in Appendix D of the ERS technical standard using standard concentrations of methacholine, a breath-actuated nebulizer, and one minute of tidal breathing. For the 16 mg per ml concentration, the nebulizer output is 2.7 mg per minute, and you multiply this by a respirable fraction of 0.76, resulting in a delivered dose of 2.05 mg, or 2050 micrograms. To calculate the dose for the other concentrations, just divide each concentration by 16 milligrams per ml and then multiply by 2050. The ERS standards recommend using non-cumulative doses. So for example, if you were using cumulative doses, step two would be 40, not 32, because you would add eight to the 32. As you can see in step five at the bottom, this step delivers over 2,000 micrograms of methacholine. This is completely unnecessary because the normal response is a PD-20 of 400 micrograms. So why in the world would you deliver over 2,000? I would say that if you're going to use this protocol, just stop after the 4 milligram per ml concentration because it already delivers over the threshold of 400 micrograms. The methacholine protocol I developed avoids delivering excessive amounts of methacholine by using a 20 second tidal breathing period instead of a full minute. And because I do think that controlling the number of breaths is important, I use six tidal breaths as a proxy for 20 seconds of tidal breathing. Why six? 
Uh, in a study by El Gamal, the average number of breaths taken in a, in a 20 second tidal breathing period was six. Now, some people argue that it's better to use five because the simulator used in this study was set to 15 breaths a minute. And I can't argue with that, but I doubt there's a difference clinically between taking five and six breaths per step. At the bottom of the page, you can see that the dose is delivered using 20 seconds instead of one minute. The last uh, step dose exceeds the 400 microgram threshold a little bit, but certainly not as much as a full minute, certainly not giving 2000 micrograms. You do have options. You don't have to use a breath actuated nebulizer. You can use a low output nebulizer. Uh, for example, you can use the Hudson RCI Micromist. This is a low output nebulizer and you can use it for a one minute pro protocol using the standard uh, quadrupling concentrations of methacholine. And as you can see here, at the end of the protocol, at the 16 milligram per ml step, the dose delivered is just slightly above the 400 uh, microgram threshold. So this is an entirely appropriate way to perform a methacholine challenge test. I mentioned earlier that I prefer a breath count over an unregulated time tidal breathing period. It makes no sense to me that we are going to focus a lot of attention on nebulizer output, respirable fraction, precise concentrations of methacholine to deliver a consistent dose, but the number of breaths taken in the tidal breathing period doesn't matter? How can it not matter? If you look at the example in this slide, if patient A takes a tidal breath of methacholine every five seconds, at the end of the one minute tidal breathing period, they would have taken 12 breaths of methacholine. But if patient B takes a tidal breath of methacholine every three seconds, at the end of the one minute tidal breathing period, they would have taken 20 breaths of methacholine. That's eight more breaths per step and 40 more breaths of methacholine inhaled over the total protocol. How can this be the same dose? Is taking six puffs of albuterol the same as taking two? This really makes no sense to me, and that's why I use a breath count instead of an unregulated time breathing period. One of the other notable directives in the 2017 ERS methacholine challenge standards is that patients should not take full inhalations of methacholine. Only tidal breaths should be taken. So why is that? We encourage patients to take full inhalation of bronchodilators followed by a breath hold. Why wouldn't we do the same for methacholine? An important concept to understand is that the act of breathing is not just about oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. The act of breathing also affects the state of airway smooth muscle. If the airway smooth muscle is kept in an isometric state and is not stretched periodically with size, it morphs into a frozen or stiff state resulting in airway narrowing as shown on the left. Periodic deep breaths and sighs keep the airway smooth muscle in a melted or more relaxed state as shown on the right. These are MRI images using hyperpolarized helium. This is not structure that you're looking at. This is ventilation with the hyperpolarized helium. As you can see in the left panel, before methacholine inhalation, there is uniform distribution of ventilation. In the middle panel, following methacholine inhalation, ventilation defects are produced. The white areas show reduced ventilation from regional bronchoconstriction. You may have noticed that some of the areas have become darker, noticeably here and here and here. This means that ventilation has increased. When these ventilation defects occur, the constricting airways pull adjacent airways open through radial traction. So methacholine produces both bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation indirectly. In the right panel, after a single deep inhalation, many of the ventilation defects have resolved and the areas that experience increased ventilation have returned to normal ventilation. This bronchodilator and bronchoprotective effect of deep inhalation can result in false negative methacholine challenge tests in patients with mild asthma. This is a study published by Don Cocroft and Beth Davis in the Journal of Clinical Allergy and Immunology back in 2006. In this study, the researchers compared the PC20 and asthmatics using tidal breathing of methacholine, shown here on the left, versus a dosimeter technique with full inhalations of methacholine, shown here on the right. As a group, the PC20 was higher. There was a smaller response to methacholine when deep inhalations were used as compared to tidal breathing. In addition, 50% of subjects with a PC20 greater than 2 had a negative test when deep inhalations were used.
25% of all subjects had a negative test when deep inhalations were used to inhale methacholine, and two subjects had a greater than 120 milligram increase in PC20 due to deep inhalations. The red lines shown here are subjects that had a 16 to 32 uh, PC20 after using deep inhalations, and the green lines indicate those who had a PC20 more than 32 after deep inhalation. So if you're going to deliver methacholine and have the patients take full inhalations to TLC with each breath, you're likely going to run into some false negative tests. Let me show you an example of how potent bronchodilator deep inhalation can be. In many ways, much more potent than albuterol. This is a recording of specific airway conductance, or ESCAW, prior to methacholine challenge, uh, when the value is low and the graph is more horizontal like so, then the airway resistance is higher. Uh, we're going to talk more about ESCAW later in this presentation. So a value of 0.15 is not bad. Uh, the reference equations for measures of airway resistance are not very robust. Uh, but an ESCAW more than 0.11 is probably normal. Following methacholine inhalation, the ESCAW drops by 60% down to 0.06. And you can easily see that now the loop is much more horizontal than it had been before. I repeated this measurement after a single deep breath, and the SCAR increased 217% higher than the pre-methacholine value of 0.15. And I repeat, this occurred with one deep breath, so it's a very potent bronchodilator. However, in asthmatics, the bronchodilator effect of deep inhalation is very short-lived. I repeated the SCAR measurement five minutes later, and the SCAR had returned down to the pre-deep inhalation value, down to 0.05. Following bronchodilator, the SCAR increased to 0.35, 130% higher than the pre-methacholine value. So as you can see, uh, deep inhalation is a very powerful uh, bronchodilator, and this is why deep inhalations are not performed to inhale methacholine. The ERS technical standards list a number of contraindications for methacholine challenge testing. Firstly is airflow limitation. So if the baseline FEV1 is less than 60% of predicted, both in adults and children, or if the baseline FEV1 is less than 1.5 liters in adults, these would be considered contraindications for proceeding with methacholine challenge testing. Spirometry quality is another important contraindication. If the patient has poor spirometry uh, technique, lots of errors, a lot of inconsistencies, and you go into the methacholine challenge protocol, it'll be very difficult to determine whether this is a response to methacholine or just poor effort. So you may find yourself in your career going into a methacholine challenge with questionable spirometry quality and regretting it. Uh, so when I'm testing patients, if they can't provide high quality uh, spirometry at baseline, I will not proceed with methacholine challenge testing. There are cardiovascular and other medical conditions that should be considered. If the patient's had a myocardial infarction or a stroke in the last three months, uncontrolled hypertension, aortic aneurysm, uh, recent eye surgery, according to the spirometry guidelines, that would be a week, or elevated ICP if the patient's had brain surgery within a month. And then the just general contraindication would be inability to perform the testing maneuver. If they can't follow the directions, both for spirometry or for using the nebulizer, that would be a contraindication for proceeding with testing. I want to take a moment to comment on the spirometric contraindications for methacholine challenge testing. As we reviewed in the previous slide, an FEV1 less than 60% of predicted in adults and children, and an FEV1 less than 1.5 liters in adults disqualifies the patient from undergoing methacholine challenge testing. However, I believe this is inadequate. I think we should include a measure of airflow obstruction, like FEV1 to FVC ratio. In this example, the FEV1 is both greater than 60% of predicted, it's 82%, and has a normal z-score. If you're not familiar with z-scores, I have a video on my channel which explains z-scores, so I invite you to go there and, and review that. Uh, in addition, the FEV1 is higher than 1.5 liters, it's 1.6 liters. The FEV1 to FVC ratio, however, is 49%, well below the lo lower limit of normal, indicating airflow obstruction. So I wouldn't feel excited about uh, administering methacholine to this patient, and frankly, I wouldn't. Uh, 
My general practice is to treat an FEV1 to FEC ratio less than the lower limit of normal as a contraindication, and I would administer bronchodilator instead. Uh, so you may want to discuss this with your medical director and consider adding this to your protocol. The ERS technical standards also give recommendations on medication withholding prior to methacholine challenge testing so you don't get a false negative test. Short-acting beta agonists need to be held for at least six hours. Uh, Long-acting beta agonists need to be held for 36 hours. Ultra-long-acting uh, beta agonists need to be held for 48 hours. Ipitropium bromide or atrovent should be held for 12 hours. Long-acting antimuscarinic agents like teotropium or spiriva, eumeclidinium, those need to be held for a full week. Honestly, I'm not sure why uh, providers put patients on these medications when they're not even sure if they have asthma. But if they're on these drugs, it has a whole week. Uh, oral theophylline is listed. You're not going to find a lot of asthmatics on that. Usually patients who are still taking that have advanced COPD and they've been taking it uh, for many, many years. But if you did come across that, they should hold that for 12 to 24 hours. So even though theophylline is listed, um, you don't need to withhold caffeine. Uh, patients can have their morning coffee. All you're going to get is grumpy patients if you withhold that. And another change from the previous uh, guidelines is you don't need to hold antihistamines either. Now, those two things, antihistamines and caffeine, um, are withheld in indirect tests if you're doing mannitol. But for methacholine challenge testing, antihistamines and caffeine do not need to be withheld. So how about withholding anti-inflammatory medications like chromalin, corticosteroids, and leukotriene modifiers? Well, the ER's technical standards state that chromones, inhaled corticosteroids, and leukotriene modifiers have little or no effect in a single dose and do not need to be withheld unless the intent is to offload the anti-inflammatory effect. Duration of the effect after regular use is uncertain, but a withhold time of four to eight weeks is reasonable. However, these recommendations aren't based on a lot of strong data. If you look at the highlighted uh, references, Reference 36 is a study using histamine. It was published in 1977. Reference 37 was published in 1976. Uh, reference 38 was published in 1984. Reference 39 with regards to leukotriene uh, modifiers was done after a single dose. And reference 40 is another old citation uh, back to 1997. This is a more recent study published in 2019, obviously after the 2017 ERS uh, standards were published. Uh, in this study, the impact of once daily fluticasone versus placebo on PD-20 was compared in patients with mild asthma. The baseline PD-20 in the fluticasone group was 52, and it was 76 in the placebo group, so pretty low actually. Um, in the fluticasone group, a single dose of inhaled steroid significantly increased the PD-20 after the first dose, and it increased 142 by the seventh dose, where, as expected, there was no change in uh, PD-20 in the placebo group. So not only do inhaled steroids seem to reduce airway hyperresponsiveness, they seem to do it rather quickly, at least in this study. My bias is that corticosteroids should be withheld prior to methacholine challenge testing. Weeks are probably better than days. And once again, uh, I just don't understand why providers prescribe corticosteroids if they're not even sure if the patient has asthma or not. Let's go through our pre-methacholine challenge test checklist. So we've determined that the appropriate medications have been withheld. There are no cardiovascular or other contraindications to doing testing. The spirometry quality is good. And the patient has adequate FEV1 and a normal FEV1 to FEC ratio. I would also add to this list the measure of specific airway conductance. You know, we have this love affair with FEV1. And FEV1 is certainly a very important parameter, not just for asthma, but obviously COPD and other disorders. But does it always tell the entire story? Well, when it comes to methacholine challenge testing, it does not. So should we look at values other than FEV1 to assess the response to methacholine? Let me convince you that the answer is yes, we should. When I perform methacholine challenge testing, I always include specific airway conductance, or ESCAR. To measure ESCAR, you need to have a body plethysmograph to measure airway resistance. Once airway resistance is measured, airway conductance is calculated as a reciprocal of airway resistance, where conductance, or GAW, is 1 divided by resistance, or RAW. 
S-gar is calculated by dividing the conductance, or gar, by the thoracic gas volume, or VTG, which is the volume of gas in the lungs when closed shutter panting was performed during the airway resistance maneuver. An important concept to understand is that airway resistance and conductance are affected by changes in lung volume. Increases in lung volume also expands airway caliber. Raw has a hyperbolic relationship with lung volume, where conductance, or GAW, has a linear relationship with lung volume. So if the patient does the open shutter panting above FRC, the resistance will be lower and the conductance will be higher simply because the patient did the panting at a higher lung volume where the airways are more expanded. If the patient does the open shutter panting below FRC, the airway resistance will be higher and the conductance will be lower simply because the patient did the panting at a lower lung volume where the, air, the airways are more narrowed. SGAR is superior to RAR or GAR because the conductance is divided by the lung volume or VTG where the panting was done. Regardless of where the patient did the panting, the SGAR is always, always the same, so it's not affected by uh, lung volume. This is a case study I had published in the Canadian Journal of Respiratory Therapy which illustrates the usefulness of SGAR during a methacholine challenge. This subject complained of dyspnea and chest tightness after exercise. His baseline spirometry indicates both a low FBC and FEV1 with Z scores more negative than minus 1.64. However, the ratio of FEV1 to FBC is normal, uh, suggesting there's no obstruction. And this pattern you could classify as the preserved ratio impaired spirometry pattern, or PRISM. Uh, you might also note that the FEF 2575 is below the lower limit of normal. The bottom table shows the maximum response to methacholine and as you can see there was only an 8% decline from baseline after inhaling all five doses of methacholine. So if you only followed FEV1 like most labs you would probably classify this as an insignificant response making asthma unlikely. However I also measured SGA during this methacholine challenge. The baseline data is shown here in the left panel and the maximum response to methacholine is shown in the center panel. And as you can see, even though there was only an 8% decline in FEV1, there was a 73% decline in ESCA, and this was accompanied by familiar symptoms by the patient. If you're just looking at the flow versus box pressure graphs, you can see compared to baseline that this is a lot more horizontal, which is what you would see in patients with obstruction. Following bronchodilator, there was an additional 27% increase in SGAR after bronchodilator. So I would classify this as an FEV1 negative SGAR positive test. The FEV1 negative SGAR positive response to methacholine is not uncommon at all. This study published by Khalid in Respiratory Care plotted the decline in SGAR on the vertical axis versus the FEV1 change on the horizontal axis. All of the data points inside the yellow box indicate an FEV1 negative SGAR positive response. In this study, they determined that an SGAR decline of around 50% may be significant, and that's the threshold that we use in our laboratory. I was fortunate to be asked to participate in this study published in Respirology with David Kaminsky's group at the University of Vermont. This study included 211 patients undergoing methacholine challenge testing with both FEV1 and SGAR being measured. A 40% decline in SGAR, or PC40, was considered significant. Overall, 25% of the patients had a positive FEV1 response, where 57% had a positive SGAR negative FEV1 response. And we concluded that 34% of patients with an asthma diagnosis would have had a quote unquote normal methacholine challenge if only FEV1 was considered. These data give strong support for including SGAR as a response variable during methacholine challenge testing. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground so far going over the fundamentals of how you do a methacholine challenge test and why we do it the way we do it. So let's review and walk through doing one, at least the way that I do it. So as you can see, we're going to have five different steps. We're going to skip the diluent. We're going to use the standard quadrupling concentrations six tidal breaths, and these are the doses that we'll deliver at each step.
Okay, so we're going to start off by administering the first dose of methacholine, or the diluent. Uh, just keep in mind, if you give the diluent step, the percent change is calculated from the post-diluent FEV1, not from baseline. So we'll give six tidal breaths of the smallest concentration, which will yield a dose of 2.6 micrograms. We'll wait 30 seconds, repeat the FEV1, and then repeat it after 90 seconds. That'll give time for the deep inhalation to wear off. Some labs do a full vital capacity and include an inspiratory loop. I do not do that. I have the ta patient take a full breath in, blast it out. After a couple seconds has passed and I know that the FEV1 has been captured, I stop there. I don't do a full vital capacity because we're really only looking at FEV1 anyways and I don't want to use inspiratory loops because that's just going to introduce more deep inhalations. After the FEV1 is recorded, it's important to assess the quality of the FEV1. Uh, if it wasn't done correctly, if there are errors, you'd want to re-instruct at this time um, and then repeat at 90 seconds. Uh, once that's been done, the question that needs to be assessed is, has the largest FEV1 declined greater than or equal to 20%? If it hasn't, you'd administer the next dose of methacholine and proceed through your protocol. If the answer is yes, if you have two FEV1s, both with greater than or equal to 20% below baseline, you'd want to make note of any symptoms. Are these familiar symptoms of the patient? You may consider remeasuring the ESCOT to verify that there's obstruction. There's any question in your mind if that's really a, a true FEV1 response. Um, and then you would administer bronchodilator and repeat the FEV1 ESCOT in 10 minutes. If there isn't an FEV1 response after all the doses, then I would repeat the ESCOT there, and that's where you may capture an FEV1 negative ESCOT positive response. Uh, once you've done that, once again, you'd administer bronchodilator and repeat FEV1 and ESCOT in 10 minutes. Once the methacholine challenge test is completed, then you can assess the response and quantify that. So the ERS has a strategy for doing that. Um, based on the PD20, we're not going to use the PC20 as we spoke. So if the PD20 is greater than 400, this would be considered normal. And then there are different gradings, borderline, mild, moderate, and marked hype responses based on the PD20. And we have that included in our report, which I will show you. Now we're going to go through some real life examples, so some real patients. So this was a patient who had a methacholine challenge in my laboratory. Uh, they take a LABA and ICS and albuterol, but those were last taken four days ago. You can see that the baseline spirometry values for FVC, FEV1, and the ratio of FEV1 to FVC are all normal. In the green zone means normal uh, Z scores. And you can also see that the flow volume loop is a nice structure. It was done properly. After spirometry was completed, I measured specific airway conductance or ESCA. You can see it here. So the open shutting panting occurs first, and so you can see the flow here plotted against cabin pressure. Then the valves are shut and the patient pants against the closed shutter to measure alveolar pressure, and that's plotted here with mouth pressure as a proxy of alveolar pressure against cabin pressure. The result was 0.21, so that's a pretty normal SCAR value. When I start the challenge protocol in the software, it first asks me, do I want to do a diluent step? And I do not, so I just skip over that. After administering the first dose of methacholine, a 30-second clock will start. After 30 seconds has elapsed, we repeat FEV1, and it is plotted against the FEV1% of baseline. So 100% of baseline is the baseline uh, value. The 80% uh, line here represents a 20% decline from, from baseline. And as you can see, after the first dose of methacholine, there's a small decrease in FEV1, so we'll move on to the next dose. After the second dose is given, you can see that there is an additional decline in FEV1, but it hasn't reached the 80% threshold or 20% decline, so we're going to move on to the next dose. After the third dose of methacholine, you can see that the value for FEV1 has fallen below that 20% uh, change. Uh, much lower than 80% of baseline. And I've documented here that the patient complains of dyspnea and chest tightness. But before we move on to giving bronchodilator, we're going to let a minute elapse and we're going to go and hit another effort. After one minute has elapsed, we repeat the FEV1. The second 
uh, FEV1 measurement is much higher. So it went from 1.67 to 2.10. Some of that may be from uh, the bronchodilator effect of deep inhalation. And when we plot this against the baseline, now for level 3 we don't have a 20% decline because we're going to go by the highest FEV1. So we're going to move on to the next dose. After the fourth dose of methacholine, there's once again an FEV1 that's greater than 20% uh, below baseline. And I've documented now the patient's coughing. And just like before, we need to do two of these. So we're going to click on another effort. This time, the second FEV1 is even lower than the first. So the patient has gotten quite obstructed. So now we can report a PD20. And it is 50. So it is uh, much lower than the normal response would be greater than 400. I went ahead and repeated the SGAW and our baseline SGAW was 0.21 but now it's 0 0.06 went down 71 percent which is quite significant. So now it's time to administer bronchodilator. I tend to give albuterol and ipratropium together uh, to reverse methacholine challenge uh, bronchospasm and once I do that uh, we'll start the timer and wait 10 minutes. Following bronchodilator administration the FEV1 has returned to close to its uh, pre-methacholine uh, value. You can see here on the plotting of the FEV1 against the percent baseline that after bronchodilator it's close up to 100% of baseline. Also repeated the SGAR. Once again our baseline value is 0.21 and after bronchodilator it's 0.23 which is basically the same. I use Morgan Scientific PFT systems and software. In my opinion, that's the best on the market. Uh, this is a graph that Patrick Morgan and myself came up with, uh, which I think is very nice and you can have on your reports. And it plots the FEV1 change as a percent of uh, baseline. And it also helps to classify the degree of airway hyperresponsiveness on your PD-20. So you can see here, with our PD-20 of 50, that that would classify as mild airway hyperresponsiveness according to the ERS standards. This table is also included in our uh, reports. Uh, so we plot both the FEV1 and the SGAR, and you can see at each step uh, when the patient had a significant decline at 1.69, that was a 34% decline in FEV1. And the SGAR, as I showed you, went down 71%. We'll also include the notes that you um, entered at each step and then after recovery you can see. So this would qualify as both an FEV1 positive and an SGA positive methacholine challenge test. We also display an overlay of the flow volume loops. Uh, green is the pre-methacholine flow volume loop. Uh, the maximum response to methacholine is shown here and you can see that the flow volume loop has become concave. And the post bronchodilator flow volume loop is in red and you can see that the baseline and the post bronchodilator loops mirror each other pretty closely. I'm going to show you a couple of other examples of different patterns that you'll see. So in this patient, uh, there really wasn't much of a change in FEV1. After the 672 dose had been delivered, there was only a 6% decline. The baseline SGA was 0.17, it was 0.16, so basically no change at all. Uh, and you can see up here, on the graph showing the uh, FEV1 plot against the percent of baseline that it really did not change at all. So this would be classified as an FEV1 negative and SGA negative methacholine challenge test. In this example, once again, you really don't see much of a change uh, in FEV1. At the highest dose, there was a 19% decline, but remember that's well above the 400 threshold. So that's not a significant change. However, if you look at SGAR, our baseline was 0.19. It went all the way down to 0.05, a 74% decrease. So I would classify this one as an FEV1 negative SGAR positive methacholine challenge test. A word of caution when assessing the final dose. When PC20 was used, a 20% decline in FEV1 was all that was necessary to declare that as a positive test. However, when we use PD20 on the final dose, we're usually giving much more than 400. So even though the patient's FEV1 may decline 20% or even a little more, it may not be a significant response because the PD20 is more than 400. So here's an example. 
where this patient had a 20% decline in FEV1, but if you look at the intercept, the PD20 is 672, so much higher than 400. So this would be considered an insignificant response. So be careful on that final dose. Your eyes kind of light up when you see that 20% decline. You really have to look at the PD20 and not just the change in FEV1. Key points to remember, methacholine challenge testing is a very useful test, but it shouldn't be viewed as a pregnancy test for asthma. Methacholine is ideally suited for patients with an intermediate risk of asthma. There are some people without clinical asthma that may respond to methacholine. Methacholine uh, response should be based on the dose of methacholine, resulting in a 20% reduction in FEV1, PD20, not the PC20. Methacholine protocols need to account for nebulizer output concentrations and breath rates so appropriate uh, doses are administered. Methacholine should be administered with tidal breaths only since deep inhalations can result in a reduced response to methacholine, potentially a false negative test. And alternative measures like SCAR or the forced oscillation technique, oscill oscillometry, may be more sensitive to changes in lung function than FEV1. Thank you for watching PFT Tutor with Jeffrey Haynes. Please click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons, and we'll see you next time.